The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 2, Side 1. In these Puranas and kindred writings of medieval India, we find a very modern theory of the universe. There is no creation in the sense of Genesis. The world is perpetually evolving and dissolving, growing and decaying, through cycle after cycle, like every plant in it and every organism. Brahma, or as the Creator is more often called in this literature, Prajapati, is the spiritual force that upholds this endless process. We do not know how the universe began, if it did. Perhaps, say the Puranas, Brahma laid it as an egg and then hatched it by sitting on it. Perhaps it is a passing error of the Maker, or a little joke. Each cycle, or kalpa in the history of the universe, is divided into a thousand Mahayugas, or great ages, of four million three hundred twenty thousand years each. And each Mahayuga contains four yugas, or ages, in which the human race undergoes a gradual deterioration. In the present Mahayuga, three ages have now passed, totaling 3,888,888 years. We live in the fourth age, the Kali Yuga, or Age of Misery. 5,035 years of this bitter era have elapsed, but 426,965 remain. Then the world will suffer one of its periodical deaths, and Brahma will begin another day of Brahma, that is, a kalpa, of four billion three hundred twenty million years. In each kalpa cycle the universe develops by natural means and processes, and by natural means and processes decays. The destruction of the whole world is as certain as the death of a mouse, and to the philosopher not more important. There is no final purpose towards which the whole creation moves, there is no progress, there is only endless repetition. Through all these ages and great ages, billions of souls have passed from species to species, from body to body, from life to life, in weary transmigration. An individual is not really an individual. He is a link in the chain of life, a page in the chronicle of a soul. A species is not really a separate species, for the souls in these flowers or fleas may yesterday have been or tomorrow may be the spirits of men. All life is one. A man is only partly a man, he is also an animal. Shreds and echoes of past lower existences linger in him and make him more akin to the brute than to the sage. Man is only a part of nature, not actually its center or master. A life is only a part of a soul's career, not the entirety. Every form is transitory, but every reality is continuous and one. The many reincarnations of a soul are like years or days in a single life, and may bring the soul now to growth, now to decay. How can the individual life, so brief in the tropic torrent of generations, contain all the history of a soul, or give it due punishment and reward for its evil and its good? And if the soul is immortal, how could one short life determine its fate forever? When the Hindu is asked why we have no memory of our past incarnations, he answers that likewise we have no memory of our infancy. And as we presume our infancy to explain our maturity, so he presumes past existences to explain our place and fate in our present life. Life can be understood, says the Hindu, only on the assumption that each existence is bearing the penalty or enjoying the fruits of vice or virtue in some antecedent life. No deed, small or great, good or bad, can be without effect. Everything will out. This is the law of karma, the law of the deed, the law of causality in the spiritual world, and it is the highest and most terrible law of all. If a man does justice and kindness without sin, his reward cannot come in one mortal span. It is stretched over other lives in which, if his virtue persists, he will be reborn into loftier place and larger good fortune. But if he lives evilly, he will be reborn as an outcast or a weasel or a dog. This law of karma, like the Greek moira or fate, is above both gods and men. Even the gods do not change its absolute operation. Or, as the theologians put it, karma and the will or action of the gods are one. But karma is not fate. Fate implies the helplessness of man to determine his own lot. Karma makes him, taking all his lives as a whole, the creator of his own destiny. Nor do heaven and hell end the work of karma, or the chain of births and deaths. The soul, after the death of the body, may go to hell for special punishment, or to heaven for quick and special reward, but no soul stays in hell, and few souls stay in heaven forever. 
Nearly every soul that enters them must sooner or later return to earth and live out its karma in new incarnations. Biologically, there was much truth in this doctrine. We are the reincarnations of our ancestors and will be reincarnated in our children, and the defects of the fathers are to some extent, though perhaps not as much as good conservatives suppose, visited upon the children, even through many generations. Karma was an excellent myth for dissuading the human beast from murder, theft, procrastination, or operatorial parsimony. Furthermore, it extended the sense of moral unity and obligations to all life, and gave the moral code an extent of application far greater and more logical than in any other civilization. Good Hindus do not kill insects if they can possibly avoid it. Even those whose aspirations to virtue are modest treat animals as humble brethren rather than as lower creatures over whom they have dominion by divine command. Philosophically, karma explained for India many facts otherwise obscure in meaning or bitterly unjust. All those eternal inequalities among men which so frustrate the eternal demands for equality and justice, all the diverse forms of evil that blacken the earth and redden the stream of history, all the suffering that enters into human life with birth and accompanies it unto death, seemed intelligible to the Hindu who accepted karma. These evils and injustices, these variations between idiocy and genius, poverty and wealth, were the results of past existences, the inevitable working out of a law unjust for a life or a moment, but perfectly just in the end. The belief in karma and transmigration is the greatest theoretical obstacle to removal of the caste system from India, for the orthodox Hindu presumes that caste differences are decreed by the soul's conduct in past lives and are part of a divine plan which it would be sacrilegious to disturb. Karma is one of those many inventions by which men have sought to bear evil patiently and to face life with hope, to explain evil and to find for men some scheme in which they may accept it, if not with good cheer, then with peace of mind, this is the task that most religions have attempted to fulfill. Since the real problem of life is not suffering but undeserved suffering, the religion of India mitigates the human tragedy by giving meaning and value to grief and pain. The soul in Hindu theology has at least this consolation, that it must bear the consequences only of its own acts. Unless it questions all existence, it can accept evil as a passing punishment and look forward to tangible rewards for virtue born. But in truth, the Hindus do question all existence. Oppressed with an enervating environment, national subjection and economic exploitation, they have tended to look upon life as more a bitter punishment than an opportunity or a reward. The Vedas, written by a hardy race coming in from the north, were almost as optimistic as Whitman. Buddha, representing the same stock five hundred years later, already denied the value of life. The Puranas, five centuries later still, represented a view more profoundly pessimistic than anything known in the West except in stray moments of philosophic doubt. The East, until reached by the Industrial Revolution, could not understand the zest with which the Occident has taken life. It saw only superficiality and childishness, in our merciless busyness, our discontented ambition, our nerve-racking, labor-saving devices, our progress and speed. It could no more comprehend this profound immersion in the surface of things, this clever refusal to look ultimates in the face, than the West can fathom the quiet inertia, the stagnation and hopelessness, quote-unquote, of the traditional East. Heat cannot understand cold." What is the most wonderful thing in the world? asks Yama of Yudhishthira. And Yudhishthira replies, Man after man dies. Seeing this, men still move about as if they were immortal. By death the world is afflicted, say the Mahabharata. By age it is held in bar, and the nights are the unfailing ones that are ever coming and going. When I know that death cannot halt, what can I expect from walking in a cover of lore? And in the Ramayana, Sita asks, as her reward for fidelity through every temptation and trial, only death. If in truth unto my husband I have proved a faithful wife, Mother Earth, relieve thy Sita from the burden of this life. So the last word of Hindu religious thought is moksha, release, first from desire, then from life. Nirvana may be one release or the other, but it is fullest in both. The sage Bhartrihari expresses the first. Everything on earth gives cause for fear, and the only freedom from fear is to be found in the renunciation of all desire. 
Once upon a time the days seemed long to me when my heart was sorely wounded through asking favors from the rich, and yet again the days seemed all too short for me when I sought to carry out all my worldly desires and ends. But now as a philosopher I sit on the hard stone in a cave on the mountainside, and time and again I laugh when I think of my former life. Gandhi expresses the second form of release. I do not want to be reborn, he says. The highest and final aspiration of the Hindu is to escape reincarnation, to lose that fever of ego which revives with each individual body and birth. Salvation does not come by faith, nor yet by works. It comes by such uninterrupted self-denial, by such selfless intuition of the part-engulfing whole, that at last the self is dead and there is nothing to be reborn. The hell of individuality passes into the haven and heaven of unity, of complete and impersonal absorption into Brahman, the soul or force of the world. 4. Curiosities of Religion Superstitions, Astrology, Phallic Worship, Ritual, Sacrifice, Purification, the Sacred Waters. Amid all this theology of fear and suffering, superstition, first aid from the supernatural for the minor ills of life, flourished with rank fertility, Oblations, charms, exorcisms, astrology, oracles, incantations, vows, palmistry, divination, 2,728,812 priests, a million fortune tellers, a hundred thousand snake charmers, a million fakirs, yogis, and other holy men. This is one part of the historic picture of India. For 1,200 years the Hindus have had a great number of tantras, manuals, expounding mysticism, witchcraft, divination and magic, and formulating the holy mantras, or spells, by which almost any purpose might be magically attained. The Brahmins looked with silent contempt upon this religion of magic. They tolerated it partly because they feared that superstition among the people might be essential to their own power, partly perhaps because they believed that superstition is indestructible, dying in one form only to be reborn in another. No man of sense, they felt, would quarrel with a force capable of so many reincarnations. The simple Hindu, like many cultured Americans, accepted astrology and took it for granted that every star exercised a special influence over those born under its ascendancy. Menstruating women, like Ophelia, were to keep out of the sunshine, for this might make them pregnant. The secret of material prosperity, said the Kaushitaki Upanishad, is the regular adoration of the new moon. Sorcerers, necromancers, and soothsayers, for a pittance, expounded the past and the future by studying palms, ordure, dreams, signs in the sky, or holes eaten into cloth by mice. Chanting the charms which only they know how to recite, they laid ghosts, bemused cobras, enthralled birds, and forced the gods themselves to come to the aid of the contributor. Magicians, for the proper fee, introduced a demon into one's enemy, or expelled it from one's self. They caused the enemy's sudden death, or brought him down with an incurable disease. Even a Brahmin, when he yawned, snapped his fingers to right and left to frighten away the evil spirits that might enter his mouth. At all times the Hindu, like many European peasants, was on his guard against the evil eye. At any time he might be visited with misfortune, or death magically brought upon him by his enemies. Above all, the magician could restore sexual vitality, or inspire love in any one for any one, or give children to barren women. There was nothing, not even nirvana, that the Hindu desired so intensely as children. Hence, in part, his longing for sexual power and his ritual adoration of the symbols of reproduction and fertility. Phallic worship, which has prevailed in most countries at one time or another, has persisted in India from ancient times to the twentieth century. Shiva was its deity, the phallus was its icon, the tantras were its Talmud. The Shakti, or energizing power of Shiva, was conceived sometimes as his consort Kali, sometimes as a female element in Shiva's nature, which included both male and female powers. And these two powers were represented by idols called Linga or Yoni, representing respectively the male or female organs of generation. Everywhere in India one sees signs of this worship of sex. In the phallic figures on the Nepalese and other temples in Benares, in the gigantic Lingas that adorn or surround the Shivaite temples of the south, in phallic processions and ceremonies, and in the phallic images worn on the arm or about the neck. Linga stones may be seen on the highways. Hindus break upon them the coconuts which they are about to offer in sacrifice. At the Rameshvaram temple, 
The linga stone is daily washed with Ganges water, which is afterwards sold to the pious as holy water or mesmerized water has been sold in Europe. Usually the phallic ritual is simple and becoming. It consists in anointing the stone with consecrated water or oil and decorating it with leaves. Doubtless the lower orders in India derive some profane amusement from phallic processions, but for the most part the people appear to find no more obscene stimulus in the linga or the yoni than a Christian does in the contemplation of the Madonna nursing her child. Custom lends propriety, and time lends sanctity to anything. The sexual symbolism of the objects seems long since to have been forgotten by the people. The images are now merely the traditional and sacred ways of representing the power of Shiva. Perhaps the difference between the European and the Hindu conception of this matter arose from divergence in the age of marriage, Early marriage releases those impulses which, when long frustrated, turn in upon themselves and beget prurience as well as romantic love. The sexual morals and manners of India are in general higher than those of Europe and America, and far more decorous and restrained. The worship of Shiva is one of the most austere and ascetic of all the Hindu cults, and the devoutest worshippers of the Linga are the Lingayats, the most puritanic sect in India. It has remained for our Western visitors, says Gandhi, to acquaint us with the obscenity of many practices which we have hitherto innocently indulged in. It was in a missionary book that I first learned that Shivalingam had any obscene significance at all. The use of the linga and the yoni was but one of the myriad rituals that seemed to the passing and alien eye not merely the form but half the essence of Indian religion. Nearly every act of life, even to washing and dressing, had its religious rite. In every pious home there were private and special gods to be worshipped and ancestors to be honoured every day. Indeed, religion to the Hindu was a matter for domestic observances rather than for temple ceremonies which were reserved for holy days. But the people rejoiced in the many feasts that marked the ecclesiastical year and brought them in great processions or pilgrimages to their ancient shrines. They could not understand the service there, for it was conducted in Sanskrit, but they could understand the idol. They decked it with ornaments, covered it with paint, and encrusted it with jewels. Sometimes they treated it as a human being, awakened it, bathed it, dressed it, fed it, scolded it, and put it to bed at the close of the day. The great public rite was sacrifice or offering. The great private rite was purification. Sacrifice to the Hindu was no empty form. He believed that if no food was offered them, the gods would starve to death. When men were cannibals, human sacrifices were offered in India as elsewhere. Kali particularly had an appetite for men, but the Brahmins explained that she would eat only men of the lower castes. As morals improved, the gods had to content themselves with animals, of which great numbers were offered them. The goat was especially favored for these ceremonies. Buddhism, Jainism, and Ahimsa put an end to animal sacrifice in Hindustan, but the replacement of Buddhism with Hinduism restored the custom, which survived in diminishing extent, to our own time. It is to the credit of the Brahmins that they refused to take part in any sacrifice that involved the shedding of blood. Purification rites took many an hour of Hindu life, for fears of pollution were as frequent in Indian religion as in modern hygiene. At any moment the Hindu might be made unclean, by improper food, by offal, by the touch of a shudra, an outcast, a corpse, a menstruating woman, or in a hundred other ways. The woman herself, of course, was defiled by menstruation or childbirth. Brahmanical law required isolation in such cases and complex hygienic precautions. After all such pollutions, or as we should say possible infections, the Hindu had to undergo ritual purification, in minor cases by such simple ceremonies as being sprinkled with holy water, in major cases by more complicated methods culminating in the terrible panchagavya, this purification was decreed as punishment for violating important caste laws, for example, for leaving India, and consisted in drinking a mixture of five substances from the sacred cow, milk, curds, ghee, urine, and dung. A little more to our taste was the religious precept to bathe daily. Here again a hygienic measure, highly desirable in a semi-tropical climate, was clothed in a religious form for more successful inculcation. Sacred pools and tanks were built, many rivers were called holy, and men were told that if they bathed in these they would be purified in body and soul. Already in the days of Yuan Chuang, millions bathed in the Ganges every morning. From that century to ours those waters have never seen the sunrise without hearing the prayers of the bathers seeking purity and release, lifting their arms to the holy orb, and calling out patiently, Om, Om, Om. 
Benares became the holy city of India, the goal of millions of pilgrims, the haven of old men and women come from every part of the country to bathe in the river, and so to face death sinless and clean. There is an element of awe, even of terror, in the thought that such men have come to Benares for two thousand years, and have gone down shivering into its waters in the winter dawn, and smelled with misgiving the flesh of the dead on the burning ghats, and uttered the same trusting prayers, century after century, to the same silent deities. The unresponsiveness of a god is no obstacle to his popularity. India believes as strongly today as ever in the gods that have so long looked down with equanimity upon her poverty and her desolation. 5. Saints and Skeptics Methods of Sanctity, Heretics, Toleration, General View of Hindu Religion Saints seem more abundant in India than elsewhere, so that at last the visitor feels that they are a natural product of the country, like the poppy or the snake. Hindu piety recognized three main avenues to sanctity. Janana Yoga, the way of meditation, Karma Yoga, the way of action, and Bhakti Yoga, the way of love. The Brahmins allowed for all three by their rule of the four ashramas, or stages of sanctity, the young Brahmin was to begin as a brahmachari, vowed to premarital chastity, to piety, study, truthfulness, and loving service of his guru or teacher. After marriage, which he should not delay beyond his eighteenth year, he was to enter the second stage of Brahmanical life as grihastha, or householder, and beget sons for the care and worship of himself and his ancestors. In the third stage, now seldom practiced, the aspirant to sanctity retired with his wife to live as a vanaprasta, or jungle dweller, accepting hard conditions gladly and limiting sexual relations to the begetting of children. Finally, the Brahmin who wished to reach the highest stage might, in his old age, leave even his wife and become a sannyasi, or abandoner of the world. Giving up all property, all money, and all ties, he would keep only an antelope skin for his body, a staff for his hand, and a gourd of water for his thirst. He must smear his body with ashes every day, drink the five substances frequently, and live entirely by alms. He must, says the Brahmanical rule, regard all men as equals. He must not be influenced by anything that happens, and must be able to view with perfect equanimity even revolutions that overthrow empires. His one object must be to acquire that measure of wisdom and of spirituality, which shall finally reunite him to the supreme divinity, from which we are separated by our passions and our material surroundings. In the midst of all this piety, one comes occasionally upon a skeptical voice stridently out of tune with the solemnity of the normal Hindu note. Doubtless, when India was wealthy, skeptics were numerous, for humanity doubts its gods most when it prospers, and worships them most when it is miserable. We have noted the Charvakas and other heretics of Buddha's time. Almost as old as a work called, in the sesquipedalian fashion of the Hindus, Shwasam Vedyopanishad, which simplifies theology into four propositions. One, that there is no reincarnation, no God, no heaven, no hell, and no world. Two, that all traditional religious literature is the work of conceited fools. Three, that nature, the originator, and time, the destroyer, are the rulers of all things, and take no account of virtue or vice in awarding happiness or misery to men. And four, that people, deluded by flowery speech, cling to gods, temples, and priests, when in reality there is no difference between Vishnu and a dog. With all the inconsistency of a Bible harboring Ecclesiastes, the Pali canon of Buddhism offers us a remarkable treatise, probably as old as Christianity, called The Question of King Melinda, in which the Buddhist teacher Nagasena is represented as giving very disturbing answers to the religious inquiries made of him by the Greco-Bactrian King Menander, who ruled northern India at the turn of the first century before Christ. Religion, says Nagasena, must not be made a mere way of escape for suffering men. It should be an ascetic search for sanctity and wisdom, without presuming a heaven or a god. For in truth, this saint assures us, these do not exist. The Mahabharata inveighs against doubters and atheists who, it tells us, deny the reality of souls and despise immortality. Such men, it says, wander over the whole earth, and it warns them of their future punishment by the horrible example of a jackal who explains his species by admitting that in a previous incarnation he had been a rationalist, a critic of the Vedas, a reviler and opposer of priests, 
an unbeliever, a doubter of all. The Bhagavad Gita refers to heretics who deny the existence of a god and describe the world as none other than the house of lust. The Brahmins themselves were often skeptics, but too completely so to attack the religion of the people. And though the poets of India are as a rule assiduously pious, some of them, like Kabir and Vamana, speak in defense of a very emancipated theism. Vamana, a South Indian poet of the seventeenth century, writes scornfully of ascetic hermits, pilgrimages, and caste. The solitariness of a dog, the meditations of a crane, the chanting of an ass, the bathing of a frog. How are you the better for smearing your body with ashes? Your thoughts should be set on God alone. For the rest, an ass can wallow in dirt as well as you. The books called Vedas are like courtesans, deluding men, and wholly unfathomable. But the hidden knowledge of God is like an honorable wife. Will the application of white ashes do away with the smell of a wine pot? Will a cord cast over your neck make you twice born? Why should we constantly revile the pariah? Are not his flesh and blood the same as our own? And of what caste is he who pervades the pariah? He who says, I know nothing, is the shrewdest of all. It is worthy of note that pronouncements of this kind could be made with impunity in a society mentally ruled by a priestly caste. Except for foreign repressions, and perhaps because of alien rulers indifferent to native theologies, India has enjoyed a freedom of thought far greater than that of the medieval Europe to which its civilization corresponds. And the Brahmins have exercised their authority with discrimination and lenience. They relied upon the conservatism of the poor to preserve the orthodox religion, and they were not disappointed. When heresies or strange gods became dangerously popular, they tolerated them, and then absorbed them into the capacious caverns of Hindu belief. One god, more or less, could not make much difference in India. Hence there has been comparatively little sectarian animosity within the Hindu community, though much between Hindus and Moslems. And no blood has been shed for religion in India except by its invaders. Intolerance came with Islam and Christianity. The Moslems proposed to buy paradise with the blood of infidels, and the Portuguese, when they captured Goa, introduced the Inquisition into India. If we look for common defining elements in this jungle of faiths, we shall find them in the practical unanimity of the Hindus in worshipping both Vishnu and Shiva, in reverencing the Vedas, the Brahmins, and the cow, and in accepting the Mahabharata and the Ramayana as no mere literary epics, but as the secondary scriptures of the race. It is significant that the deities and dogmas of India today are not those of the Vedas. In a sense, Hinduism represents the triumph of aboriginal Dravidic India over the Aryans of the Vedic age. As the result of conquest, spoliation, and poverty, India has been injured in body and soul and has sought refuge from harsh terrestrial defeat in the easy victories of myth and imagination. Despite its elements of nobility, Buddhism, like Stoicism, was a slave philosophy, even if voiced by a prince. It meant that all desire or struggle, even for personal or national freedom, should be abandoned, and that the ideal was a desireless passivity. Obviously, the exhausting heat of India spoke in this rationalization of fatigue. Hinduism continued the weakening of India by binding itself through the caste system in permanent servitude to a priesthood. It conceived its gods in unmoral terms and maintained for centuries brutal customs, like human sacrifice and sati, which many nations had long since outgrown. It depicted life as inevitably evil and broke the courage and darkened the spirit of its devotees. It turned all earthly phenomena into illusion and thereby destroyed the distinction between freedom and slavery, good and evil, corruption and betterment. In the words of a brave Hindu, Hindu religion has now degenerated into an idol worship and conventional ritualism in which the form is regarded as everything and its substance as nothing. A nation ridden with priests and infested with saints, India awaits with unformulated longing her renaissance, her reformation, and her enlightenment. We must, however, keep our historical perspective in thinking of India. We too were once in the Middle Ages and preferred mysticism to science, priestcraft to plutocracy, and may do likewise again. We cannot judge these mystics, for our judgments in the West are usually based upon corporeal experience and material results, which seem irrelevant and superficial to the Hindu saint. What if wealth and power, war and conquest, were only surface illusions, unworthy of a mature mind? What if this science of hypothetical atoms and genes, of whimsical protons and cells, of gases generating Shakespeare's and chemicals fusing into Christ, were only one more faith, 
and one of the strangest, most incredible, and most transitory of all. The East, resentful of subjection and poverty, may go in for science and industry at the very time when the children of the West, sick of machines that impoverish them and of sciences that disillusion them, may destroy their cities and their machines in chaotic revolution or war, go back beaten, weary, and starving to the soil, and forge for themselves another mystic faith to give them courage in the face of hunger, cruelty, injustice, and death. There is no humorist like history. Chapter 19 the life of the mind. 1. Hindu science. Its religious origins, astronomers, mathematicism, the Arabic numerals, the decimal system, algebra, geometry, physics, chemistry, physiology, Vedic medicine, physicians, surgeons, anesthetics, vaccination, hypnotism. India's work in science is both very old and very young young as an independent and secular pursuit, old as a subsidiary interest of her priests. Religion being the core of Hindu life, those sciences were cultivated first that contributed to religion. Astronomy grew out of the worship of the heavenly bodies, and the observation of their movements aimed to fix the calendar of festival and sacrificial days. Grammar and philology developed out of the insistence that every prayer and formula, though couched in a dead language, should be textually and phonetically correct. As in our Middle Ages, the scientists of India, for better and for worse, were her priests. Astronomy was an incidental offspring of astrology, and slowly emancipated itself under Greek influence. The earliest astronomical treatises, the Siddhantas, circa 425 BC, were based on Greek science, and Varaha Mihira, whose compendium was significantly entitled Complete System of Natural Astrology, frankly acknowledged his dependence upon the Greeks. The greatest of Hindu astronomers and mathematicians, Aryabhata, discussed in verse such poetic subjects as quadratic equations, signs, and the value of pi. He explained eclipses, solstices, and equinoxes, announced the sphericity of the earth and its diurnal revolution on its axis, and wrote in daring anticipation of Renaissance science, The sphere of the stars is stationary, and the earth by its revolution produces the daily rising and setting of planets and stars. His most famous successor, Brahmagupta, systematized the astronomic knowledge of India, but obstructed its development by rejecting Aryabhata's theory of the revolution of the earth. These men and their followers adapted to Hindu usage the Babylonian division of the skies into zodiacal constellations. They made a calendar of twelve months, each of thirty days, each of thirty hours, inserting an intercalary month every five years. They calculated with remarkable accuracy the diameter of the moon, the eclipses of the moon and the sun, the position of the poles, and the position and motion of the major stars. They expounded the theory, though not the law, of gravity when they wrote in the Siddhantas, The earth, owing to its force of gravity, draws all things to itself. To make these complex calculations, the Hindus developed a system of mathematics superior, in everything except geometry, to that of the Greeks. Among the most vital parts of our Oriental heritage are the Arabic numerals and the decimal system, both of which came to us through the Arabs from India. The miscalled Arabic numerals are found on the rock edicts of Ashoka, 256 BC, a thousand years before their occurrence in Arabic literature. Said the great and magnanimous Laplace, It is India that gave us the ingenious method of expressing all numbers by ten symbols, each receiving a value of position as well as an absolute value, a profound and important idea which appears so simple to us now that we ignore its true merit. But its very simplicity, the great ease which it has lent to all computations, puts our arithmetic in the first rank of useful inventions, and we shall appreciate the grandeur of this achievement the more when we remember that it escaped the genius of Archimedes and Apollonius, two of the greatest men produced by antiquity. The decimal system was known to Aryabhata and Brahmagupta long before its appearance in the writings of the Arabs and the Syrians. It was adopted by China from Buddhist missionaries, and Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarazmi, the greatest mathematician of his age, died circa 850 AD, seems to have introduced it into Baghdad. The oldest known use of the zero in Asia or Europe is in an Arabic document dated 873 AD, three years sooner than its first known appearance in India but by general consent the Arabs borrowed this too from India, and the most modest and most valuable of all numerals is one of the subtle gifts of India to mankind. 
It was used by the Mayas of America in the first century A.D. Dr. Breasted attributes a knowledge of the place value of numerals to the ancient Babylonians. Algebra was developed in apparent independence by both the Hindus and the Greeks, but our adoption of its Arabic name, al-Jabr, adjustment, indicates that it came to Western Europe from the Arabs, that is, from India, rather than from Greece. The great Hindu leaders in this field, as in astronomy, were Aryabhata, Brahmagupta, and Bhaskara. The last, born 1114 A.D., appears to have invented the radical sign and many algebraic symbols. These men created the conception of a negative quantity, without which algebra would have been impossible. They formulated rules for finding permutations and combinations. They found the square root of two and solved in the 8th century A.D. indeterminate equations of the second degree that were unknown to Europe until the days of Euler, a thousand years later. They expressed their science in poetic form and gave to mathematical problems a grace characteristic of India's golden age. These two may serve as examples of simpler Hindu algebra. Out of a swarm of bees, one-fifth part settled on a kadamba blossom, one-third on a cylindra flower, three times the difference of those numbers flew to the bloom of a kutaja. One bee, which remained, hovered about in the air. Tell me, charming woman, the number of bees. Eight rubies, ten emeralds, and a hundred pearls, which are in thy earring, my beloved, were purchased by me for thee at an equal amount, and the sum of the prices of the three sorts of gems was three less than half a hundred. Tell me the price of each, auspicious woman. The Hindus were not so successful in geometry. In the measurement and construction of altars, the priests formulated the Pythagorean theorem, by which the square of the hypotenuse of a right-angled triangle equals the sum of the squares of the other sides, several hundred years before the birth of Christ. Aryabhata, probably influenced by the Greeks, found the area of a triangle, a trapezium, and a circle, and calculated the value of pi, the relation of diameter to circumference in a circle, at 3.1416, a figure not equaled in accuracy until the days of Purbach, 1423-1461, in Europe. Bhaskara crudely anticipated the differential calculus, Aryabhata drew up a table of signs, and the Surya Siddhanta provided a system of trigonometry more advanced than anything known to the Greeks. Two systems of Hindu thought propound physical theories suggestively similar to those of Greece. Kannada, founder of the Vaisheshika philosophy, held that the world was composed of atoms as many in kind as the various elements. The Jains, more nearly approximated to Democritus, by teaching that all atoms were of the same kind, producing different effects by diverse modes of combination. Kannada believed light and heat to be varieties of the same substance. Udayana taught that all heat comes from the sun. And Vachaspati, like Newton, interpreted light as composed of minute particles emitted by substances and striking the eye. Musical notes and intervals were analyzed and mathematically calculated in the Hindu treatises on music, and the Pythagorean law was formulated by which the number of vibrations, and therefore the pitch of the note, varies inversely as the length of the string between the point of attachment and the point of touch. There is some evidence that Hindu mariners of the first century A.D. used a compass made by an iron fish floating in a vessel of oil and pointing north. Chemistry developed from two sources, medicine and industry. Something has been said about the chemical excellence of cast iron in ancient India and about the high industrial development of Gupta times when India was looked to, even by imperial Rome, as the most skilled of the nations in such chemical industries as dyeing, tanning, soap-making, glass, and cement. As early as the 2nd century B.C., Nagarjuna devoted an entire volume to mercury. By the 6th century, the Hindus were far ahead of Europe in industrial chemistry. They were masters of calcination, distillation, sublimation, steaming, fixation, the production of light without heat, the mixing of anesthetic and soporific powders, and the preparation of metallic salts, compounds, and alloys. The tempering of steel was brought in ancient India to a perfection unknown in Europe till our own times. King Porus is said to have selected, as a specially valuable gift for Alexander, not gold or silver, but thirty pounds of steel. The Moslems took much of this Hindu chemical science and industry to the Near East and Europe. The secret of manufacturing Damascus blades, for example, was taken by the Arabs from the Persians, and by the Persians from India. 
Anatomy and physiology, like some aspects of chemistry, were byproducts of Hindu medicine. As far back as the 6th century BC, Hindu physicians described ligaments, sutures, lymphatics, nerve plexus, fascia, adipose and vascular tissues, mucus and synovial membranes, and many more muscles than any modern cadaver is able to show. The doctors of pre-Christian India shared Aristotle's mistaken conception of the heart as the seat and organ of consciousness, and supposed that the nerves ascended to and descended from the heart. But they understood remarkably well the processes of digestion, the different functions of the gastric juices, the conversion of chyme into chyle, and of this into blood. Anticipating Weismann by 2400 years, Atreya, circa 500 B.C., held that the parental seed is independent of the parent's body and contains in itself in miniature the whole parental organism. Examination for virility was recommended as a prerequisite for marriage in men, and the Code of Manu warned against marrying mates affected with tuberculosis, epilepsy, leprosy, chronic dyspepsia, piles, or loquacity. Birth control in the latest theological fashion was suggested by the Hindu medical schools of 500 B.C., in the theory that during twelve days of the menstrual cycle, impregnation is impossible. Fetal development was described with considerable accuracy. It was noted that the sex of the fetus remains for a time undetermined, and it was claimed that in some cases the sex of the embryo could be influenced by food or drugs. The records of Hindu medicine begin with the Atarva Veda. Here, embedded in a mass of magic and incantations, is a list of diseases with their symptoms. Medicine arose as an adjunct to magic. The healer studied and used earthly means of cure to help his spiritual formulas. Later he relied more and more upon such secular methods, continuing the magic spell, like our bedside manner, as a psychological aid. Appended to the Atarva Veda is the Ajur Veda, the science of longevity. In this oldest system of Hindu medicine, illness is attributed to disorder in one of the four humors, air, water, phlegm, and blood, and treatment is recommended with herbs and charms. Many of its diagnoses and cures are still used in India, with a success that is sometimes the envy of Western physicians. The Rig Veda names over a thousand such herbs and advocates water as the best cure for most diseases. Even in Vedic times, physicians and surgeons were being differentiated from magic doctors and were living in houses surrounded by gardens in which they cultivated medicinal plants. The great names in Hindu medicine are those of Sushruta in the 5th century before and Ch